ten percent of this entire <laughs> program gypsy scene is the gypsy scene. <laughs> Amazing. And I think the reason they did it is because they had Vincent Price and they're like, Vincent Price, everyone knows your normal cool voice. Can you do any other voices? And he's like, well, I can talk like an old witch. And they're like, we're doing the gypsy scene, everybody. Lillian, I have a question for you. Oh, okay. I have an answer for you, hopefully. When was the last time that you prayed with your family? (laughs) Because apparently that's really important. (laughs) Okay, here's the news that I wasn't, I had decided not to share on the podcast, but was the very first thing that I thought of when we heard the classic Jane Eyre phrase, (laughs) a family that prays together stays together, which is my family used to pray together. (laughs) We did not stay together. Amazing. (laughs) Um, Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. We are today talking about, uh, I believe it was 1950. Is that right? Mm -hmm. 1950 radio production brought to you by, it was literally called like the family. Family theater is what it's called. Family theater. Okay. Yes. Um, Which in case you had any doubt, they quickly (laughs) let you know right from the top that this is very much a Christian based organization and they really want you to pray, especially with your family. Because um, <laughs> praying with your family is going to lead to peace on earth. Yeah. You know, apart from the religious undertones, I did like that they were like, hey, it's important <laughs> to be generous and kind and thoughtful of others. And I'm like, yeah, I agree with those things for sure. And the best way to get there is to pray every single night with your family. I don't want to roast <laughs> this too hard because it is, I think it's a lovely idea. If that's, we're not making fun of the idea of praying with your family. Yeah. We're making fun of the idea that praying with your family solve all of the world's problems it was also so funny for me to like hear that and then have vincent price talk because (laughs) i think of him as the like the king of campy horror films and i do not Mm -hmm. usually associate that with like a you know christian-based sort of um entertainment system so i i just found that was very funny but yeah so (laughs) we have this this radio drama we have vincent price and What's the lady's name? Donna Reed, who I have some fun facts about for later. Okay, cool. Yeah, Donna Reed and um, Vincent Price. Any initial thoughts before we kind of talk about this very brief version of Jane Eyre? I think my initial thoughts are very similar to what you said to me right before we got recorded, which for our regular listeners, you're probably wondering, but you guys, aren't you going to summarize this? It was 25 minutes. So if we summarized it, we would just be reenacting the radio program. <laughs> Essentially, yes. (laughs) So that was my initial thoughts was, oh, it's kind of like our Jane Eyre speed runs that Mm -hmm. we do. Yes. Except it's Vincent Price and Donna Reed. Yeah. I think one thing that stood out to me is mostly just, I mean, this whole medium is their voices. And so that's mostly what I have to go off of here. And I loved hearing him do these lines um, because, again, I have so much like nostalgia and Mm -hmm. fond thoughts about uh, Vincent Price and his beautiful voice. But it was so funny to me to hear this kind of style of radio drama speaking Mm -hmm. that feels very much like these are voices that not only do you hear in radio programs of this time, but also like this is like how people talk in this kind of era of like movie and cinema. And so it's very funny to hear what sounds like a very strong, I would guess maybe like 28 year old at the youngest, 32 year old at the <laughs> oldest woman doing this very mature, like reading for Jane. So it felt very different, uh, but it was interesting. I forgot to check her age at the time because I think you're a, you're really close to the right age for her. Yeah. I she think- was 28, 29. Woo, look at me go. Yeah. <laughs> I clocked it somehow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, they're, they're, their voices felt very of the time period. And once again, one of these situations where they're not trying to do British accents. It's just kind of that transatlantic fancy talk. Uh-huh. Um, and it's just sort of like, I just got a, out of my elocution school and now I'm going <laughs> to speak on the radio. And it's like, well done. You did it. <laughs> you did it. Um, that's how I feel about this program. <laughs> I, I think if I were to summarize it, I won't go through the plot. What it really is, is, and I think it's, 
I was, because I was thinking about that while I was watching it. I was like, I literally wrote down at one point, if you don't know Jane Eyre, this is not Jane Eyre. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I think if you did know Jane Eyre, and if this was a book that you liked, and you were wanted to listen to it with people who maybe didn't, and wanted to just hear excerpts of it, I'm guessing what this series is, because they did a lot of other pieces of classic literature, is more, would you want to hear incredibly famous actors deliver some famous monologues from a story that you love Mm -hmm. contextualized in such a way that you can understand what's happening around it. Yeah. And that's what I feel like this was. For sure. So let's kind of talk about some of their decisions for what they chose to focus on and what they chose to remove. Because once again, and I, it's pretty classic, if you're doing a short version, you're going to chop out the childhood and you're going to chop mm-hmm. out the Sinjin parts because you're like, we only want the romance. We're going to just summarize those bits. We didn't even, I think, get vague mention at all about any kind of Lowood or any of that. It simply began with her being like, hey, I've been a governess at Thornfield for a while. And one night I was out delivering a letter and I found a man who had fallen on his horse and I went to go chat with him and I just love his like he does the kind of like questioning for a little bit of her being like oh I could get help I live at Thornfield he's like what do you mean you live at Thornfield you know who owns that house and she's like yeah Mr. Rochester and she's like what does he look like what does he like she's like I don't know I've never met him and he's like that's because he's me (laughs) like instantly just announces himself as her boss like very funny yeah it's just another it was a few of those moments where it's like some of those lines, this this was a very jarring, at times, deeply accurate, like reading parts of the book. Mm-hmm. And then at other times, so inaccurate, I felt confused. Yes. <laughs> I, this was, so this was a 29 minute runtime total. And that included all of the instructions on how and where and when and why to pray with your family. Mm-hmm. So it was about 25 minutes of like actual program, yes. which we're going to, I want to save finishing the horse talk to talk about my other favorite thing that happened in this production, but we're going to save that as a little nugget. Cause I worry we'll talk about it exclusively the whole time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but the things they chose to focus on was really interesting to me. I think it made sense where they started it. It was very jarring to listen to them, like read lines from her meeting him. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden for him to just like totally do something different, which like they did need to establish, if you have 25 minutes, you need to establish this voice is Jane, this voice is Rochester just yeah. immediately. Right. So him saying like, hi, I'm Rochester. Yeah. <laughs> nice to freaking Makes meet sense. you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause then, I mean, we get a little bit of uh, a fireside scene of him, like, you know, alluding to how he could have like been different, uh, but he was set on this path. Which was the same way of like very jarring in Mm -hmm. that parts of it were straight up and down lines from the book that we don't usually see in adoptions. Yeah. And then also her talking about her aunt. Yeah, right. Inexplicably. Yeah. (laughs) I love that they did include the whole being like, oh, Jane, study me. Do you think I'm handsome? And she's like, nope. And they went into that little thing. And so it was funny. Yeah. With your small amount of time, how do you build a story about these two people having this kind of spark and a man Mm -hmm. immediately deciding to like weirdly gaslight and lie to her. (laughs) And I think the key, if, if we're getting to the thing that is the only thing I have any interest in talking about, the real key and the real heart of Jane Eyre Mm -hmm. is the gypsy scene. They did it. They included the gypsy (laughs) scene with the lead playing the gypsy, which is like, uh, amazing and they I did three minutes in their 25 minute production of Jane Eyre mm-hmm. they did three minutes over 10 percent of this entire <laughs> the program gypsy scene is the gypsy scene amazing and I think the reason they did it is because they had Vincent Price and they're like Vincent Price everyone knows <laughs> your normal cool voice can you do any other voices and he's like well I can talk like an old witch and they're like we're doing the gypsy scene everybody Buddy. <laughs> so I have the MP3 files for this radio program, which means if Piper is willing, we will cut in a little bit of Vincent Price's voice right here. Gladly. You just heard Piper's incredible impression of it. Thank you. This is Vincent Price's. Please. I didn't come to hear Mr. Rochester's fortune or Miss Ingram's. I I came to hear my own. Mm, your fortune is yet doubtful. Chances meted you a measure of happiness, but it depends on you to stretch out your hand and take it. Your heart says, yes, yes, but your brow says, 
I dare not. I dare not even permit myself to hope, or I shall be lost. Lost. And now, Miss Eyre. The play is played out. Mr. Rochester. Yes, the old gypsy takes off her cloak and bonnet, and behold, Mr. Rochester. <laughs> Wild. <laughs> so good. I actually kind of really like the way, I think he kind of deepened his voice when he went back into Rochester to kind of be like, look, see the difference? I was a, a little witch, but now I'm the man who wants you to fall in love with me. It's like, this is so bizarre. It's such a small amount of time to find that attractive. It's like, no one would. We have to fall in love. We have 25 minutes to fall in love with Rochester, marry him, have the wedding be interrupted, Establish Bertha as a like illusion, and then also like we know how hard Jane Eyre speed runs are, and you're telling me that you needed three minutes to have him gaslight her as a gypsy. So freaking good. Um, okay, a few things of like detail wise when we're going into like the how this how these lies are kind of spun is when we have the burning bed scene. He asks her, he's like, "Oh, you've heard that laugh before, I reckon." And she does the whole like, "Yeah, there's a lady here who sews. Her name is Grace Poole." And this was one of those instances where he does not confirm her theory of being like, "Yep, it was Grace for sure." He simply kind of says Grace's name as like a pondering thought, where she's like, "Oh yeah, there's a lady here who sews. Grace Poole," and he's like. Grace Pool. Anyway, um, you should probably go, but don't go, but stay. <laughs> yeah, which I think that does, if I'm remembering, they do do the fire scene. I was so excited to talk about the gypsy scene. They do, so the, the beats they chose to follow mm -hmm. is Horse on Road. Yes. Fireside Chat. Well done, Fireside Chat. Fire, good, short fight. Like, you're getting to the heart of it. Talking about Grace Pool. Grace Pool is one of four voiced characters in this production, mm -hmm. which is an interesting choice. Then he brings Grace Poole up again as the gypsy? <laughs> yes, yes. He's like, oh, she's a good friend of mine. Don't question Grace Poole. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Grace Poole always has friends who are gypsies and come to the house, and that will make you trust her more. <laughs> <laughs> so Oh my gosh. Yes. Okay. So when you mentioned we looking up her age and everything, I feel like maybe this Christian theater didn't want such a big age gap because there's a line when they're doing the fireside chat and he's like, he's like, oh, but you can submit that because I am like worldly uh, traveled and somewhat older than you. That's like, is what he says where normally he's like, the line is, I am twice your age, like old enough to be your dad. Let's kiss. And so this one, they're like, no, 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 no. He's just a little bit older than Jane. <laughs> There's a couple other moments in this where I was like, why would you say it that way? Is it because it's very Christian of you? Yes. If you're, <laughs> it is not wrong to think that Jane Eyre has very religious themes. Mm -hmm. But I would not say that Jane Eyre is very pro-organized religion church. Agreed. <laughs> so they did do a little bit like, there was a few references towards the end as well of like, the reason that you got burned was God said so, and then God forgave you. And that's why you got your eyesight back, which is in the book, a tiny little, tiny little bit. Kind of, yes. <laughs> but again, you have 25 minutes and that's what you're going to talk about? Okay. So we had a gypsy moment. There's a, yes. a wedding is inter interrupted. Um, no, no, no. Mason gets attacked. Yes. Oh, yes. We need is, to talk about that. Did you recognize the voice of Mason? Uh, no. Is that someone famous I should know? Everyone on every single one of these four voiced actors is somebody that at a minimum, you would recognize something they were in. The The voice of Mason mm -hmm. in the his very last thing he was ever in, his name is Ben Wright. I don't know that you'd recognize his name. You might recognize his face because he is one of those people who's in like a lot of stuff. Okay. But the very last thing he's in is a little animated movie that came out in 1989 called The Little Mermaid. Oh, can you guess what actor he, what character he was in The Little Mermaid? Was he Sebastian? He was not Sebastian. Okay, I don't know. Flounder? No, no. Scuttle. He was. <laughs> he was a human being. Was he Prince Eric? <laughs> Foley was just like an old man, but Prince Eric. <laughs> Incredible. We brought in this ninety-year-old to, but he has the voice of a hot seventeen-year-old man. <laughs> 
<laughs> His name was Grimson? Grims- Grimsby. Grimsby. Okay, the butler to Prince yes. Eric. Nice. Yes, which I have a picture of, and I will put on social a picture of this human man next to Grimsby. Um, <laughs> and Because that's someone we recognize. So he's, he's the first non-voice character, which if you're... I thought about this a lot because I was like... This was a wild adaption. Mm -hmm. The choices they made were not the choices I would make. But I was like, obviously, you need a Jane and you need a Rochester. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to have two additional voice actors be on this show, I don't think that Mason (laughs) and Grace Poole would crack my list. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's wild. Um, I thought I was surprised by how, again, refined uh, Grace Poole's voice was. Um, But she was a bit. They way expanded Grace Poole's role in this show. Yeah, that yeah, that is bizarre. That really because, yeah, when she goes back to Thornfield and Grace Poole explains things, that should have been a Mrs. Fairfax but well, if you had had a Mrs. Fairfax earlier, like mm-hmm. I think they were what I the thing that I was thinking about is like they decided they needed to only establish fewer characters. Mm-hmm. Like they referenced the fact that Mrs. Fairfax was there, but that was she was just referenced one time. That was all Mrs. Fairfax was in this. So if you're establishing a character and you decide you need Grace Poole as your scapegoat for your Bertha, expanding her role makes a bit of sense Mm -hmm. but wow was she a main character in this (laughs) radio show well i guess she needed they're like we we can't like have bertha really be the villain because she's only going to be cackling and laughing so we'll have the kind of scapegoat maybe side character like which i do think it was the same actress who did bertha's Laughter. laughter which by the way i thought added a nice level of um intensity to when jane is left to tend mason um mm-hmm. and you can just hear her screaming and cackling like beyond the tapestry we presume that would be terrifying because yeah when Rochester's going to go to get the surgeon mason is like don't leave me here and he's like she's fine i locked the door and i have a key like i'd be like holy shit what is going on like i don't like this why are we alone with this mad woman like literally a few feet away very scary yeah that will the mason scene where jane is just like not even questioning taking care of this man who has been fully bitten yes will never make sense to me (laughs) i know i know seriously so they do the mason scene they do the wedding scene the wedding gets interrupted Mm -hmm. and then i was really disappointed that they did not have him try to defend his actions at all. And they had no stay speech beyond what he said at the wedding. Right. Because he simply says, I'm trying to think of exactly like how he describes her. He's like, no, I was like forced to marry this lady. And he's like, and she became like, what? Is, he's like grotesque and like awful or something. But he like used like some like hideous, I don't know, some word that just simply described her as like ugly or something. And I was like, well, that's just mean. <laughs> like, yeah. hey, hey, come on. He, yeah, he was like really mean about Bertha. He just talked about how he like never considered himself married to Bertha. Mm-hmm. And then we cut to a voiceover of Jane being like, I left that night. Yeah. <laughs> no explanation of where she went or what she was doing. She just was gone. And yeah. then she heard his voice. And then it's um, like, ah, fuck it. I'll go back, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and then Grace Poole is there to greet her being totally normal. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. The other thing, though, that was... was- wildly jarring um with how short of a version this was is when he does the gaslight right before the proposal of being like he's like yep i'm gonna be marrying blanche like i'm in love with blanche and uh, my future mother-in-law found a place for me to send you uh because i don't love you and she's like oh i'm gonna miss you and he's like psych i do love you want to marry me and she's like okay sounds great and it literally made me think lillian did you ever see the youtube uh that's mostly where it, i know it from um but the the comedy musical twisted no no okay so the group that did a very potter musical um and a couple of other famous like comedy musical things mm-hmm. they did uh this musical twisted which is a satire that kind of combines the disney movie aladdin with sort of the plot line of like wicked of like mm-hmm. what if jafar wasn't a bad guy and it was actually this whole other thing but so what they do and what happened in this radio pod radio version that we listened to today made me think of the scene that they have in this musical which is incredible where after uh jasmine sees aladdin but like in his prince costume and she's like wait so you were lying before and he's like yeah i'm not an urchin i'm actually a prince everything i said to you before was a lie don't you trust me like like that 
that's like a line in their story and I'm like that's this <laughs> it really like it was really jarring and I was trying to think like that basically from the wedding on feels very and I mean this in like feels very religious propaganda you to me a little like, yeah <laughs> her just leave it like not even listening to him not feeling like it's a moral quandary like not question beyond just like she's sad but she's not devastated she's in like a, a haze is how yeah. they describe it like and it's not this is i i feel this is not a terrible for what it is <laughs> it's okay yeah. but it is a 25 minute version of jane Eyre put on by a religious organization. Yeah, totally. And I think we can all agree that Jane Eyre is a story that should never be condensed into 25 minutes. So It should be condensed into two minutes by somebody who's rambling. Yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> and, if you, and if you're like, you know what? I actually do want to listen to this. I've got some great news for you about, <laughs> should I put a super cut together of us just doing that? Oh my God, no, it would no, be, it would I think be it would so bad. It'd melt our brains. Um, oh my God. <laughs> should we talk about this cast? Because I think we've yes. said everything that needs to be said about this. I have so many, I have so many things about the cast. So can you talk about Vincent Price? Because I don't know a lot about him. I will gladly talk about Vincent Price. So my favorite reference to him is I was probably first introduced to him through the Disney animated film, The Great Mouse Detective. He voices Professor Radigan, which is their version of Moriarty in this whole kind of like uh, Sherlock Holmes sort of story. Um, so I first knew him as an animated evil rat uh, and I nice. love him dearly. <laughs> um, but uh, also he is very well known for doing the spooky narration at the end of Michael Jackson's very famous thriller, both in the music video and in the song. He had a very prolific career of being in at least a hundred films, many of which uh, were these kind of campy horror movies. He was kind of one of the top tier kind of spooky actors of that time. He was in like House on Haunted Hill, Mask of the Red Death, anything that was like kind of spooky and over the top, Vincent Price was in it. So he had this reputation of like being that. I also just did some research research because I'm like I know there's a lot of stuff about this guy that are going to be really interesting and so some things that I didn't know about him until today is that in addition to being this actor that is very well known um, he was also a very prolific um, fine art collector uh, he had this massive art collection um, and he and his wife uh, his second wife I believe they were very firm believers that fine art should be viewed by the public for free so they famously throughout their lives donated many many uh, classics from like Rembrandt's and all kinds of other things. He had a Van Gogh that he gave away because um, he's like, yeah, people need to be able to see this for free. So that's awesome. He was also a gourmet chef and liked to cook dishes for his uh, co-stars whenever they would do movies. He had all kinds of cookbooks that he wrote. He had a cassette tape series that it's like cooking instructions so you can listen to Vincent Price like tell you how to make recipes oh my god if anybody knows how to uh, acquire that please let me know Piper's birthday's in April and so I need it by then <gasps> oh my god that'd be amazing it's like here's this like 20 cassette collection of Vincent Price telling you how to make dishes from the stars yes um, and all kinds of random stuff like that so Vincent Price what a character full of surprises tell me what you know about the other other people, Lillian. The one thing that I found about Vincent Price to wrap up uh, our talk about him is one of his first forays into entertainment at all was through another Jane Eyre Rochester, Orson Welles. Oh. He actually started working in Orson Welles had Mercury Theater was like his thing. We oh. are going to listen to a Jane Eyre production by Mercury Theater with Orson Welles from 1938. That is when he got connected with Orson Welles, got into the entertainment industry, started doing stuff with that. So um, that was just a fun little connection of some of our Rochesters that I thought we would all enjoy. But hey. our Jane in this is Donna Reed. And did you recognize that name at all? I know the name. I did look her up on IMDb. So I now you? know what her big famous thing is. But you tell us. So she's actually got a couple of big famous things, but 
the one that is most relevant to this time of the year is she was in It's a Wonderful Life in 1946. Yeah. Do you know anything about, I've got some fun facts about It's a Wonderful Life because I figure it's kind of Christmassy and I didn't think we were going to talk for three hours (laughs) about this 25 minute production of Jane Eyre. I know it's a Christmas classic. I've only really watched it once. It wasn't like a a staple in my household. Um, But most often when I think of it, I don't really think of the Christmas scenes because growing up, I did love the movie Bruce Almighty with Jim Mm. Carrey. And he watches like a scene from that and he later mimics it with his godlike magic. So I often think of the, what you want, the moon? I'll throw a lasso around it and pull it down. (laughs) That's my best Jimmy uh, Stewart impression. That's your impression of Jimmy carry doing jimmy stewart (laughs) which is great yes exactly it's filtering down (laughs) um but so i actually this is a fact that patrick my brother shared with me um years ago that i did confirm via the internet today which is it's a wonderful life is such a bizarre movie and the things that we know about it. So It's a Wonderful Life came out in 1946. It's basically like at the time, like modern day retelling of the idea of A Christmas Carol. Mm -hmm. It did not do well in the box office. It barely broke even for how much money they had spent making it. So the producer actually never made another movie again because because of this movie and went out of the industry. The reason that that is important is because It's a Wonderful Life was not a hit when it came out. It got nominated for some Oscars. I could not figure out why it wasn't a hit if it got nominated for literally five Oscars, but I don't understand the movie industry at the time. Um, (laughs) But because it was not very well known, it's copyright lapsed. And so it was in the public domain. And so people television programs were looking for something they could play around Christmas. So it was always on TV at Christmas. And that's how it became a Christmas classic that everybody thinks of as like, when you're listing classic Christmas movies, It's a Wonderful Life is on all of those lists. And it's because it was in the public domain. And then it became this classic thing. So Donna Reed, even though this movie came out four years prior, was not very famous necessarily. She was like very in similar ways to Vincent Price. She was out there. She was doing a lot of things. She did. She did a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But she was not as famous as we would think of somebody from a Christmas classic being. She was no like Judy Garland or anything like that. Yeah. She, a few years later, three years later, was in From Here to Eternity and was won a, an Oscar for that. She won an Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress, along with her co-star, Frank Sinatra. Aw, yay. Good old Frank. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting, complex human being, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very true. <laughs> so then she later was in, the reason I recognized her name is very niche. Hmm. which is she had a TV show that she produced with her husband called the Donna Reed show, which I find hilarious that it was called the Donna Reed show because they gave her character a different last name in the show. Oh, funny. (laughs) So she was still Donna, but she was Donna like Stevens or stove or something. Uh, Stove. (laughs) Here's the thing. thing. I don't remember what it was, but it was close to stove. Oh my God. (laughs) What are you, an appliance stove? He's like, no, I'm a man. (laughs) But the reason I know that show, it was very famous at the time. It was like one of the big sitcoms that people knew and it ran for years Mm -hmm. is it was featured in an episode of Gilmore Girls. And they did like a whole episode about the Donna Reed show. And that's why I know Donna Reed. (laughs) This is how so many of our generation know things from the previous generation is because they're referenced in the media that we consume. And we're like, what's that thing? I think I saw it in Bruce Almighty. (laughs) It's like, oh, yeah, it's from Gilmore Girls. They talk about it there. (laughs) So the last uh, person in this cast is the actress who voiced Grace Poole is Irene Tendu. It's spelled T-E-D-R-O-W. She is very similar to Ben Wright, who we've already talked about, who was in just like a ton of stuff. You would recognize his face. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the actress who voiced Grace Poole, just like in everything. And she was most famous for being in a show that I also only know from references to references, which is Dennis the Menace. Okay. She w- played a neighbor in Dennis the Menace. Oh, is she the the nosy neighbor across the street? 
She's Mrs. Inkins. Inklins? I think a word. I think I'm thinking of the right person. Yeah. I sure. believe you. Neat. And so she also, I believe she also did the birth of laughter, but I couldn't find confirmation for that. They did credit that. They're like, mad woman laughter also provided by. <laughs> well, because they, they didn't even say like who, which roles. They just said additional cast members, Ben Wright and woman whose l- name, Nate, last name William can't pronounce. <laughs> Amazing. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of how I found those. And if I'm wrong about who these people are, um, blame Google and also Family Theater yeah but yeah fun cast fun production wild choices very wild choices i love this <laughs> not uh, at all how i would have done it <laughs> dude i feel like we need to play some kind of a mini game here because it's only 30 minutes and we've talked about the cast extensively we've talked about everything that can be said about the radio program i, don't I know. feel like we just average this out with our birth episode <laughs> and you've got two episodes there i really i feel like we just like we let you go. We did. We did the thing. A baby episode. Hey, yeah, you get some time back to your day. Sure, we can do that. Yeah, <laughs> and we will. We are also going to be back next week with a mini episode on Jane Eyre. Oh, speaking of, you want to fill some more time here? Some other the other things that we're working on. So next week we are doing a true mini episode. We are going to be playing a game next week. Okay, which I I don't know if we want to share the details or save them. Let's just say I'm. Very, very excited about our game. Okay, cool. Can't wait. (laughs) I told you, if you're not, it sounds like you're not remembering it. We talked about it a really long time ago. I do not remember what this is. (laughs) So I, like the audience, am going to, I'm in for a surprise. (laughs) Amazing. I'm so happy. I'm just smiling and nodding. I'm like, I'm in on the joke. Ha ha ha. I also know what this is. <laughs> you did. To be fair, I did talk to you about this. I just talked to you about it in like October. Gotcha. So we're going to be doing that next week. If you are looking for more Air Buds content, very excitingly, last at this point, by the time you're listening to this, last week on Friday on our YouTube channel, we released the very first of something I've been working incredibly hard on, which is video episodes where I cut together for our episode on chapter 27. I cut together a bunch of different footage from all our different adaptions and put that over our commentary on chapter 27. So if you're looking for more Jane Eyre, go check that out. And if you're trying to get a friend who likes Jane Eyre, but maybe hasn't listened to our podcast yet, but would watch an hour and a half long video on yeah, that's, YouTube. That's how you get them to do it. <laughs> I don't know, maybe. Um, <laughs> sh- please, please watch it. I spent so much time on this, you guys, and I really hope you like it. Yay. Yes, go check out Lillian's amazing YouTube content. Also, if you're looking for a Christmas gift for me, subscribe to our YouTube channel. We It's very new, so it's fair that we don't have a ton of subscribers yet. But it would be really nice for me. <laughs> you know what, guys? It would be the Christian thing to do. Um, Lillian will be praying that you will subscribe to her YouTube channel. Subscribing to our YouTube channel might lead to peace on earth. You don't know. You know, we won't know unless you press that button. So mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> smash that smash that like and subscribe button. <laughs> Ring it, that bell. We can't make any promises, but it might lead. <laughs> Incredible. Oh my gosh. <laughs> A lot of kind of like mini versions of those videos that uh, Lillian makes are also shared as like stories and things like that on Instagram as well. So check out Instagram, uh, Facebook, Twitter, all that jazz. A lot of that can be found there too. We'd love to hear from you guys. Uh, You can DM us at Airbuds uh, or send us lengthy emails um, Mm. with your favorite Vincent Price fun facts. Um, Yes. (laughs) Because we need that beautiful voice always in our ears. Um, Yes. Airbuds at gmail.com. And if you listened to this episode and you were like, you know what? Short and sweet, they nailed it. Those <laughs> those ladies deserve five stars for Christmas. I'm just going to keep making you think that it's Christian and Christmassy to give us what we need to promote our <laughs> podcast. Five, if you feel we've earned five stars, giving us five stars and writing, maybe write your fam- favorite Vincent Price fact with no context as to why mm-hmm. in your review. Just if you guys start writing random things or in the reviews, we'll read those. Yeah. Sure. If you write like fun, interesting things in your review, give only if you give us five stars. If you want us to read it, you have to give us five stars. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we would, we would greatly appreciate that. Yeah. So um, I guess until next week, it feels so odd to like wrap something up this quickly. <laughs> <laughs> There's uh, nothing more to say. 
away. I know. Um, we love you guys. Thank you for tuning in for this mini ep. Uh, and uh, have a wonderful holiday season. Stay warm out there. If it's anything like here in Minnesota, you're flocked with snow. So go do a frolic. You know, you have 30 minutes back to your life. That's an order. Frolic in the snow. Have some fun. Go, go frolic, guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We love you. <laughs> See you next week. Bye. Bye. <laughs>